It's time to get your music radio ready with the Audio Skills Podcast. It doesn't matter what type of music you're creating or what gear you use. It's all about the technique. Get ready to turn your home studio into a place where your music goes platinum. Now give it up for your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey everyone, Scott back with you for another edition of the Audio Skills Podcast. We've got a bit of a unique show for you today where we're going to be talking about recording and mixing, not necessarily for music, but instead for film and television. I'm of the mindset that learning about other audio disciplines can only help you expand your own knowledge as you work on creating fantastic sound in your home studio. And to help me cover all of this will be Matt North, who is a pro audio engineer specializing in audio post-production based out of Norwich, England. Now, before we jump into all of that, I wanted to offer up my audio tip of the week. And each week, I try to give podcast listeners a piece of the kind of tips and techniques that I cover more in-depth in tutorials on audioskills.com and our YouTube channel, or just offer up solid advice to help you with your music making. And that's what this week's tip is all about specifically. You know, sometimes it can be really difficult to find time to record and mix music. I know I've struggled with that myself. Life gets in the way, you're struggling with a project and demotivated and so on. Other times it's difficult to just finish a project, especially in a home studio. You know, you can spend forever just tweaking and tweaking a project, especially when you're not specifically spending money for that studio time. In my experience, the best way to combat All of this is to simply set recording and mixing schedules for yourself. I am a huge fan of this. If you use Google Calendar or some other planning software or even an old-fashioned date book, use it to plan out your studio time. Treat yourself like a professional even if you don't feel like one or don't have to be a professional, quote unquote. You know, if you're just using a microphone and a laptop, go ahead and still treat that like it is a professional studio and you are paying for that studio time and schedule it out. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I don't exactly have a boss. I get to set my own hours. But being goal, task, and and more importantly, schedule-driven has helped me so much in so many things. You know, each week you should have at least one, at least one recording, songwriting, mixing, or mastering session. Make time for it and stick to it. That's how you develop habits and grow your efficiency because I want you to make better music, but that can't happen if you're spending hours and hours fiddling with one thing. That can't happen if you never seem to be able to find the time to record or produce. You won't get better if you're not actually doing. So bottom line, I know that was long-winded, but schedule home studio time specifically and stick to it and you will not regret it. That's my audio tip of the week. All right, now to shift gears to our main interview and topic of discussion today. I am so pleased to be joined by Matt North, who is a pro audio engineer educated at the University of Lincoln, and he's worked on film and TV programs for production companies like Spindle Productions, the BBC, and many more. And he's going to be sharing his knowledge and expertise with us and actually educating me a bit on this side of the audio world. So, hey, Matt, how are you doing today? Welcome. Hey, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are things uh, across the pond this spring? I know you mentioned uh, that you had to take a week off because it sounds like things have been pretty busy for you. Yeah, no, they have. It's been it's been good. It's been it's been a good start to the year. Obviously, things politically are a little bit um, crazy over here at the moment, <laughs> as, as they oh, are yeah. everywhere. But let's, <laughs> that, let's focus on, um, on the good stuff. So, um, but sure. yeah, all good things. Right on. So kind of to start us off, can you just tell us a little bit about your experience and career in audio production and kind of how you got your start in sort of the film and TV world of audio? Sure. So, I mean, I guess the main, the the place to start is 
I mean, I've always loved kind of music growing up. I was in bands as a teenager. And as I find when I listen to podcasts and listen to professional, other professionals and how they got into the industry, 99% seem to stem from um, a love of music, performing music. So yeah, my background really is in music. I, yeah, as I say, I love it. So when it came to me finishing high school, I was wondering what I could do. I didn't go to university straight out of school. I decided to have a couple of years out working whilst I decided what I wanted to do. And then I one day had enough of my job. I thought, just sort of sod it. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna kind of you know look into doing studying audio specifically music. I was just you know I hadn't even thought about film sound at that point. So I applied and got accepted onto the audio production program at the University of Lincoln back mm-hmm. in 2009. I think I was now crikey, that's quite a, quite a while ago. So. Yeah, I kind of started on that. It wasn't until the second year that we kind of did a, a module on, um, or it could have been the end of the first year, actually, um, a, a module on audio for visual media. And mm-hmm. it was kind of like a light bulb moment went off when it's sort of like, this sound, this is incredible. Like, I'd never thought about this before. It's kind of like, this is where I want to focus kind of my energy and my studies. So for the rest of my degree, I kind of focused in the area of sound for visual media, both location production and post-production sound design and everything like that um, right on. so yeah that's kind of where everything started out and then when it came to graduating I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do I obviously wanted to get into sound for visual media I, whether that be location or post-production I wasn't too sure at that point but um, a friend that I studied with um, fortunately had been working for as work experience throughout his third year at a shopping television channel so probably, it's the rival over here in the UK to uh, to QV see okay um, okay yeah so he was working there as sort of a, a tech op so doing a bit, of, bit of sound a bit of cameras and stuff like that and um just as i graduated they were hiring so i went he put in a good word i went along for an interview and uh, managed to get a job as a technical operator so that involves shooting a bit of cameras in the studio a bit of lighting which i've obviously never done before and also mixing sound um for live broadcast which is normally fairly st- standard setup a couple of studio mics um a couple of mics in the studio uh, on presenters and guests and after a few months an opening came up in the audio department and I went for it and I got the promotion or kind of sideways promotion I guess into being a solely audio operator so I was fortunate enough over that period so early on in my career to over this period of about eight months mix over sort of 500 hours of live of live broadcast audio which is a great way to cut my teeth so to speak it was uh, oh, absolutely. thrown into the deep end and whilst I say it was fa- a lot of it was fairly basic setup and um, when you look when I look back at it now now, but it was a great way just to, to to kind of throw me in at the deep end and um yeah to kind of explore that side of things working in a production team and everything like that but I was always actively seeking out f- more opportunities and I was educating myself f- even further um in my spare time and a position came up down in London as a sound recordist for a small kit and crew company so the company hired out cameras and professional production gear to a wide range of clients and um, they had an opportunity for someone to join their team as their sort of staff sound recordist so they would go out with with their kit and their crew for a whole range of productions their main client being a primetime BBC show called The One Show amongst many others as well as sort of some corporate shoots for um, some of the clients and things like that and I was fortunate enough to get that position so I moved down to London and spent about a year working down in London doing various production shoots so sound recording using boom microphones radio mics mixers um, into cameras and more of a run and gun style thing than a cart based setup which I can talk a bit more about in a bit and then yeah so and then after after about a year of that for personal reasons I decided to move up to Norwich which is sort of east of England about two hours from London um, mm-hmm. there's not really much of a audio scene up here so to speak or much of a media or TV but I do some work at the university here in Norwich and as a media producer for them. So I create a lot of uh, visual media content for them, both audio wise and visual wise. And then in my other side of stuff that I do is um, my freelance work. So I kind of take on all sorts of post-production mainly um, projects now, and whether that be sound design for short films, mixing for short films, also for a lot of kind of branded content. So for viral marketing and stuff like that. So I'm kind of well, yeah, well, covered in that if that makes sense in that yeah, kind of no, area like I'm spreading my, like spreading my yeah. quite wide but <laughs> right on but yeah so that's basically me so 
Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. It, so bottom line, you've got a lot of experience and you've co- sort of uh, worn a lot of hats uh, during your time working in audio. So to kind of shift gears a little bit here, you know, you work in Pro Tools and, you know, this is something that, you know, the digital audio workstation is the heart of, you know, if you're making music or any kind of audio, your digital audio workstation is is where a lot of the magic happens. And, you know, someone such as yourself, who is, has obviously worked in this for quite a while now, do you have any tips or advice for folks who might want to work more efficiently in, in either Pro Tools specifically, or if, if they're more general tips in, in any DAW? I mean, I think the thing, first thing to address really is there's a lot of talk, I think, in Pro Audio about what is the best door, you know, digital audio yeah. workstation door, whatever you want to call it. What is the best, you know, what has the complete skills, uh, you know, feature set that's going to enable me to do my work quicker, more professionally and uh, to a high standard, etc. I, from my experience personally, I don't know if there is such a thing as the best. I think it's, there's obviously Pro Tools has kind of risen throughout the industry's progress. As um, the through, standard, has as, kind as of, it were. Yeah, as kind of the standard, I guess. But there's so many kind of competitors coming out now, you know, with sort of Nuendo. I think I saw something today. They've just announced Nuendo 8 and they're kind of aiming that at post-production professionals as well as sort of Studio One. There's obviously Logic for music production as well. So I think it's there's quite a wide range of options for people who, both from the music side of things and in post-production as well. But the the reason I use Pro Tools is, I mean, that's what I was kind of taught as part of my my degree. So that is kind of what I have kind of come to know. And anybody who, who works frequently in digital audio workstations will know how important shortcuts are and muscle memory and everything like that. So that's kind Absolutely. of what I've gotten used to. But in terms of tips for working with inside Pro Tools compared to anything else, I mean... I make a big use out of window configurations in Pro Tools. So Mm -hmm. as part of my workflow, I have a specific template that I load up for every single project that I do, consisting of various dialogue tracks, effects tracks, sound effects tracks, music, atmospheres, all of that kind of stuff. And... Yeah, so I kind of work with Windows configurations and programming those to shortcuts to enable me to very quickly change my track views. So Mm -hmm. my template has probably got something like almost 100 tracks in it, for example. Um, So I can quickly just with with a press of a few buttons on the keyboard, I can limit that down to say my 10 dialogue tracks that I may be working on. So if I'm as I'm playing through and I'm editing something and there's something in the dialogue that kind of sticks out, I can quickly instead of hiding tracks and kind of you know trying to zoom in on that particular section i can very quickly change my view just to the dialogue tracks and i've kind of got it how i set up how i want it how i like it so any files that i receive from the picture editor um, Mm -hmm. of the audio session i can import that into my pro tools template and very quickly kind of map that to my track lane and how i like to work and then use those kind of windows configurations shortcuts memory locations things like that to enable me to glide through the project as quickly and as smoothly as possible because that's a big thing as well you know often we're working to tight deadlines so being as speedy as you can without if you can save 10 seconds by going through a few menus and you can spend those extra 10 seconds you know sweeping through an eq trying to find out that problem frequency you know that's time well saved so yeah i guess that's kind of the only tips that i could kind of really think of other than you know thinking about what you are doing sure being very methodical about it as well absolutely and i think that's such a great point um that was actually one of my audio tips uh in in a previous episode was you know learn to use and make use of uh, mixing templates because, you know, it can save you so much time um, and also just help your general workflow. If you, you know what tracks you have, you know where you are, you know where to find what you need. And of course, every project is slightly different, but kind of having a framework that is already built that you can kind of, you know, put your project into, I mean, that's got to be helpful for sure. Definitely. Um, So my next question here is, uh, this was really interesting to me. So you offer audio restoration services, which is mm-hmm. including, you know, removing or lowering unwanted noise, distortion, hums, pops, buzzes, things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes folks recording music and, 
you know, I always recommend, uh, even if they're doing their best to try to get it right at the source, which again, I do recommend, <laughs> yep. uh, that'll make it a lot easier for yourself, Definitely. but they might, they might run into these issues. They might have some project that is like, man, we really like this, but it's got these issues. What kind of strategies, if you could just kind of give an overview, really, do you employ to fix these types of audio issues? Okay. Well, I mean, as when I when I studied audio, you know, there wasn't really at that time anything out there on the market in terms of digital tools to be able to help with this, this kind of situations. Mm-hmm. There was very expensive hardware tools from back in, you know, sort of denoising units and everything like that. Sure. Um, but with the advancement of technology, I kind of quite heavily rely now, actually, and as I think a lot of other post producers do around the world in terms of, you know, who work in audio post on a product made by a company called Isotope called RX. So it's actually the release date today of the new version of RX. And I've literally just before I come on this podcast, just downloaded it. So I'm intrigued to try it out. Right on. <laughs> um, and this, yeah, so... Basically, it's it's an incredible tool that is. I like to describe it when I talk to students when I kind of w- are with them um, at the university as well. Is um, talk about it's kind of like a Photoshop for audio. So it will display okay. your audio file as a spectrogram. So. Mm-hmm. That will allow you to see instead of a waveform or you overlay a waveform on top of your spectrogram. And in, in the same way a waveform works from left to right and over time, you have a spectrogram that highlights particular frequencies, um, volume or their level in terms of a brightness of color. So for things like sirens in the back of a piece of camera on location or something like that, you can, sometimes you can visually see the, the siren comes in of that siren and you can visually see it in the, um, in the spectrogram. So that, and there's some amazing tools that, they, that you can use within RX that will help you to push those noises either down completely into the noise floor. So they are virtually unheard without damaging the original audio. There's some crazy algorithms that are going on there and it is just a, a lot of the time it is kind of thinking that this tool can no way get rid of that for me. And then, you know, a bit of tweaking, a bit of, you know, critical listening and being like, is that working? And you can do pretty powerful things with it. So sometimes a case of uh, using the declip module enables you to take a, a waveform that's probably been squared off or clipped at a certain point. And I, I'm guessing the way it works is it takes samples and kind of interpolates in between those samples of what has been, what data has been chopped off and kind of dis- and, and thrown away. So it's an incredible tool. I quite heavily rely on that. Obviously, I don't know how much you've kind of gone into a sort of 32-bit float and everything like that with your listeners. But I mean, it's not something we really or I really use much in post production anyway. But that enables would enable you as well to kind of recover any clipped audio after the fact if you've recorded at that bit depth. So RX has been a great tool over the recent years, and it's really kind of cemented its place in the industry. I think as uh, as an amazing and vital tool for anybody who's kind of doing that level of audio editing. And there are um, certain features um, that lend themselves to music producers as well. There is a kind of a deplosive module that they've um, recently brought in, which um, oh, yeah. a, a couple of clicks of a button can remove plosives from voice saving you having to go in and kind of you know kind of get rid of all of anything below. 120 hertz just to just to save a, a plosive at a certain point during a take for example maybe that can help remove that instead so it's an incredible tool so if anyone hasn't heard of that then go check it out i would right on yeah, fully recommend so it. so you kind of mentioned this actually just now in your in your last answer you mentioned about you, you know listening critically to you know if you were trying to edit out a siren or or, or using this tool and, and is this working is this helping whatever do you have any tips or advice for folks who are wanting to improve their critical ear? I think, I I mean, I really struggled with this. I'll, I'll put my hands up and put, kind of put myself out there. I struggled to kind of develop my critical ear. And I mean, before I studied uni- at university, I kind of kept all my digital music collection at 128 kilobits per second and kind of just, you know, shoved it on and wasn't really listening to it in that in that much right. level. And now I, you know, would kind of be hor- horrified at, uh, <laughs> at, the, uh, <laughs> at the thought of doing that. But I used, um, there's some, there is a couple of great tools out there. There's certain apps and um, tools that enable you to kind of 
learn your frequency range quite well so for example i think there's a there's a sort of a, like a gamification kind of style of this called uh quiz tones that i've used quite quite heavily in the past yes quiz tones yeah yeah kind of the thing i loved about that was how it can take music that you know very well that you've already got on your phone or anything like that and can boost it at 3 dB at 240 hertz and 3 dB at 300 hertz, and you've got to guess which one which one it is um, based on your knowledge of frequencies. And it will play just one version, and it's a great way for you to critically start thinking about. I mean, the way I kind of picked up on it is is kind of learning those sonic signatures of um, those frequencies and how, at certain levels, how they can kind of change your perception of the audio change your perception of certain instruments in that music that's how i really kind of develop my critical ear as well as just think sort of taking a step back and it's especially in film it ruins every film for you from that point that you kind of realize and kind of get into it because you're no longer <laughs> immersed in the film you are breaking it apart and as a, as is the case for probably a lot of music producers as well once you enter this world and you develop a critical ear you can't just sit back and enjoy that audio anymore you are constantly thinking about how <laughs> it was recorded working <laughs> exactly you're constantly thinking about the you know the spaces the reverbs of the instruments that they you know they've put been put in the stereo field and everything like that so i mean it's just a case of, of just critically listening and asking questions about why is that instrument panned that way or especially in a film mix sort of why atmospheres are so loud or the other side of it with a film mix particularly is that you're not necessarily mixing for pleasure but for the ear you're telling a story you know the sound is accompanying the visual imagery so you're telling a story with sound as well which is a whole different world and of ways of to play on emotions with the with the audience so it's not a case of necessarily making it sound beautifully polished it's about creating an environment for the audience to experience the story so critical listening kind of comes into that in some sense of you're not always trying to achieve the best possible sure. sound, but it's, it's what fits and what's, what works visually, you know, with the rest of the project. So, so yeah, I, I think that kind of, I hope that kind of answers that question. No, I think that, I think that absolutely does. I think there's a lot of great takeaways there and yeah, definitely check out that app folks out there. If you're, if you're really serious about trying to develop your critical ear. Now, my next question here, and, and, and this is really interesting to me because, you know, we all in audio, there's there's similar tools, right? Mm -hmm. And it's how you apply those tools is where it's different. And I'm curious, you know, when you are mixing for film, how might you use a tool like equalization? Well, I think the big thing with EQ in terms of audio post-production for any kind of visual media is... sure. The difference with between post-production and music will probably be the fact that with post-production, you're not always trying to well 90 percent of the time you're not using things like eq to be creative necessarily you're not trying to right. change the sonic character of that sound you're merely using it as a corrective tool so for from location recordings if there's kind of a little bit of wind rumble that comes in you might want to roll off from a certain point if the mic was slightly too close on a voiceover you you know you can kind of adjust the low end on that as well as just taking out kind of resonant frequencies in people's voices and, and the environments that, that you've been recorded in i always employ it as mu as a much more corrective tool than whether i'm trying to be more creative with it as you probably would have that approach in music if that's if that kind of makes sense i mean i've not done a whole great deal of music mixing or recording so you can probably talk a bit, you know advise me a bit more on that on how you would approach it in music but definitely in post-production i would just yeah employ it as a corrective tool rather than trying to be creative with it it's about trying to make it sound as it should to the audience rather than it trying to sound you know beautifully polished so to speak right on no that makes a lot of sense and i would say just for music you know i think eq is is both because i think you you do use it correctively in music oh, sometimes oh yeah, true. But, yeah yeah very true but yeah you're right in the sense that you know eq can also be very 
creative and, and a lot of people use it that way. I mean, I use it that way as well. And yeah, for film, you're probably, you know, you're probably not going crazy like, oh yeah, I just want to really boost this guy here or cut <laughs> or yeah, cut yeah, this yeah. out <laughs> and yeah. see what happens. <laughs> I mean, it, it also works with, especially if you've got a kind of a, a, a really built up scene, you know, I was talking about with like loads of tracks, you know, you might want to boost a, a few dB at sort of three or four K just to bring out the sibilance in the, in the dialogue to help it just cut through that mix a little bit more because obviously dialogue is the most in- integral part of any story so that yes. is what the audience should be able to hear very clearly at all times and there has been recent situations here in the uk with rising complaints from listeners um regarding to mumbling actors i don't know if you've if <laughs> you, you've heard about this um so you know things like that can really help with e- by using eq in that way to help cut through a mix just what you need to hear um you might solo that dialogue track and it sounds horrible but in context of the entire mix it works and that's what is important kind of going off that i recently watched fantastic beasts and where to find them oh, okay uh, with my wife that. yeah and i understand that he was trying to to go for this because of the character but there was just some some mumbling lines there that were kind of hard to hard to hear so uh maybe that's the kind of thing where uh where some eq might have helped a little more exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah oh it's i think with the case of that it's um it's it means i haven't been on location it's a difficult battle to fight with especially with directors as a sound person you don't want to be that guy who's you know halting production and impeding the <laughs> schedule because you're having problems but at the end of the day it's your responsibility to raise them so you know if an actor's mumbling even if it is part of their character Character, you know there is an issue of intelligibility there on location there's only so much you can do with it after in post-production it's about getting it right at the source and with directors knowing the script inside out as well you know what they might be able to uh, if they've got the script in front of them and they're reading the lines as as it's being delivered that might make perfect sense but of course the audience at home are not going to have that so <laughs> absolutely so kind of moving on from this but uh, really Really, these are the two tools that are, are are so so common, and I'm not sure how much you might even use this tool. But when you're mixing for you know post production for film or or what have you, how might you use a tool like compression, or do you use a tool like compression? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's kind of similar to EQ in that respect, in terms of not necessarily corrective, but it's much more about controlling the dynamics rather than trying to apply any kind of sonic characteristic to any sound. I mean, there are certain situations where maybe in explosions or things like that, that you kind of want to compress it, not only to limit the dynamic range um, to get it to fit into the mix, but you also want to give it that kind of harshness and also the kind of the, the, the low end character that you could get from by doing that. But it completely depends on the project. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the kind of online content that I produce, which mm-hmm. is mainly just sort of sound effects um, or dialogue, music, and a few kind of spot kind of foley sound effects, I normally only would put sort of dialogue on the on the EQ track, and I'd only use it where I felt like it need, needed it. So probably setting a reasonable threshold and and only using a very slight ratio, nothing to. Sure. I mean, I personally don't like going anything above sort of two two and a half to one, because especially on dialogue that can really start to impede the quality of the voice. So. Sure. Yeah, I use it sparingly unless I need to kind of achieve a certain effect or f- kind of feel like it could help achieve a certain effect that I want to achieve. But ultimately, it's probably, I, I, I mean, again, I've not done too much music production and music mixing, but I would presume that post-production would use it a hell of a lot less than a music would or rely on it a lot less, should I say, probably. Yeah, but I would also say that the same philosophy really should apply when people are using compression. You know, you don't, unless you're specifically going for effect, over compressing is is just bad news. And so kind of what you were saying, um, you know, obviously, again, it's different when it's just dialogue, but using it as a tool and lightly and with intention is, is just so critical yeah. rather than, you know, some people out there just slapping a compressor on it and saying, okay, I'm going to crank this up, you yeah. know, 40 to one, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, that's something like that. So it seems like that there, that's at least a similar philosophy. So now you have talked to before about this a little bit, but, you know, location sound recording. And I think this is just interesting for me. It's just 
in terms of, uh, you know, I make tutorial videos and things like that. And mm -hmm. so I'm recording on location sometimes, though I didn't study that. <laughs> Could you give an overview of maybe some of the specific miking techniques or, or general philosophies you might employ when you are, you know, doing some location sound recording? Sure. I mean, it's, again, it's, it really depends on the situation and the environment, Sure, but there are some kind of, kind of blanket kind of ideas or kind of unwritten rules that are kind of you, um, professionals follow to kind of get the best results. So, I don't know if I describe a scenario of say being outside in a noisy environment on a on a street if we were outside doing vox pops for example you know interview members of the public on the street for for camera work in those sorts of situations we'd normally use a shotgun microphone yeah so a long thin microphone with a very narrow pickup pattern in terms of its polar pattern which is mainly directly from the the uh, front of the capsule and also a little from the behind as well mm -hmm. and the those microphones have interference tubes on either side so they're able to significantly reduce in volume and also reject any sound coming from either side of the microphone. So it really allows you to kind of pinpoint your specific target, if that makes sense. I always describe yeah, where, it. where the source is. Yeah, exactly. I always describe it and it's, it's so crucial with positioning. And that's why boom operators, I think, are the most underrated people on a film set in terms of how skilled they are in being able to manipulate and maneuver that microphone around in between actors, swinging it as they're speaking to allow that specific i always describe it as like a laser coming out of the uh, the end of the end of the microphone you want to make sure that that mm -hmm. laser is hitting if that invisible laser would be hitting between the mouth and the and the uh, sternum area of the chest to be able to get the natural sound that as an audience we're all used to hearing anything else a few inches either side of of that kind of axis and you'd be getting some significant colorization of that sound so those certain microphones um i'm actually using one i'm, I'm in the middle of moving studio so some of my stuff's uh, boxed up at the moment so I'm currently using um a sennheiser mkh 416 to just talking into right now so i'm actually talking through a shotgun mic right now not probably <laughs> the uh, not probably the uh, best use of the mic but it, it sounds it sounds all right um, sounds pretty good to me great <laughs> <laughs> So, and then, yeah, so, but then when you kind of go indoors, you can kind of have, run into issues with reverberation or early reflections in certain rooms. Oh, yeah. So depending on how reverberant the room is, you would choose to use a different kind of pickup polar pattern on a microphone mm -hmm. for that. Mainly, uh, you'd look at using more of a hypercardioid to avoid the uh, reflections entering the back of the microphone like you would get with a shotgun. So using one of those instead to kind of, again, minimize the um, minimize those reflections and the use of radio microphones as well, hidden under clothing. They are very good at reducing very targeted kind of personal mics. So it's hard to it's hard to describe unless you listen to a recording of a boom microphone on a voice and then a, a radio microphone at the difference in the ambience levels in the background it's almost like sometimes with a radio microphone you've kind of stripped away a lot of that ambience and you've kind of got a very close up personal mic sound but that is always i mean to my ears anyway a boom microphone will always sound superior and whenever i do recording i always try and use the boom as much as possible but there are certain situations where the boom just won't sound as good in that space with that sh particular shot with that frame line that you've got to stay out of so it's about using the right mics for the job. And the great thing with advances in radio microphone technology is as the transmitters get smaller, as you can use more and more transmitters together on a set. So you can have, say, four or five actors mic'd up at once, you know, God knows how many more as well. So there's a wide range of possibilities there that you can capture all of those radio microphones at once and have a boom operator as well. And it's about giving post-production as many options as possible. So those, those decisions can be made in the studio afterwards about what sounds better and what's going to work for that scene is how they've decided to approach it with the rest of the sound that they're going to add in in post-production, whether the sound of the, the reverberance in the room from the, from the boom mic will work in that space or whether they actually want a cleaner signal to apply reverb to afterwards so they can control the amount of reverb that they, they add to that voice in that space. The main aim of location sound is to capture the dialogue as cleanly and as neatly as possible because it's a lot easier to add things to a voice than it is to take them away. So 
that is kind of the main kind of ideology, I guess, even down to the point of, you know, trying to reduce footsteps on location. There's there's products out on the market. I think there's a product called Hush Heels. I've not personally used them, but I know some some friends of mine who have, who you would put them on underneath the shoe, underneath the shoe to avoid the shoe making sound when anybody walks on a particular surface huh. to help reduce you know to, to minimize the the opportunity of that sound bleeding onto the the dialogue track so that everything else can be added in afterwards because that way you've got the most control over what it likes if the director says those footsteps are a bit too loud for me you have the ability to bring those down rather than them being burnt in so to speak to the dialogue track so yeah, I, I, I hope I haven't rambled on too much about it. It's the sort of thing that I can talk about for ages. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really interesting. And I think kind of some key takeaway there is, you know, you mentioned using the right microphone for the job and mm-hmm. especially when you're when you're recording anything and, and, and certainly music as well. I encourage folks out there to, you know, build out that microphone locker slowly but surely and, you know, really think about the decisions you're making, whether you're recording an instrument, whether you're recording a vocal, mm-hmm. and, and then also consider the space you're working in. And yeah, it's 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 kind of like you said, uh, uh, Matt, that that you know the the more options you give yourself, that that can only help for sure. Definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially, it's great that I, um, for me to be able to well, when I was doing location sound a bit more prominently, having a hand and knowledge of the post production side of things because that will, you know kind of helps with knowing what would help me in post-production so how to approach my location sound recording to be able to give whoever would be doing the post-production the most flexibility as possible yeah you would you would know if there was a decision that like oh man this is going to make someone pull their hair out exactly (laughs) this is going to be this is going to be like three hours of work if i don't sort it out now so (laughs) right on right on so again and that goes back to to getting it right at the source which is something i'm always harping on like a broken record here totally well my last question for you, Matt, and for folks out there, maybe, you know, you never really thought about this side of the audio world. You know, certainly, Matt, you mentioned that you kind of went into to audio, you know, interested in music and stuff, and then sort of discovered this and was like, wow, this is, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. What sort of advice would you give to someone who has that epiphany, as it were, and then they want to break into this side of the, the pro audio world? I mean, it's notoriously is, I mean, I think the first thing to realize is, and the quicker you can accept this, the better, I think that it is a very competitive industry. You know, there's so many people who study it, who don't really have the heart, who, you know, don't push themselves as much as they, as they should or could. And it's only the people who really, I think, really dedicate their time. I mean, I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to kind of walk straight from university into a related job in, in the field and kind of progress my skills and knowledge and career from there. I've been super fortunate in that respect. But I think for anyone who is maybe studying audio at university or college or is just kind of starting out thinking that this might be a career that they want to get into, I just record as much as possible. You know, I often go out and just record stuff randomly Randomly, just you know with some tools to gather some sound effects for a project maybe or just to kind of learn a new bit of kit or something like that it's mm-hmm. just about i think that also goes back to kind of developing the critical ear as well just recording as much as possible doing as much as possible and just kind of developing in that way and then hopefully as you kind of progress get more confident and kind of get some good feedback on your work from there you'll be able to kind of take on start start getting some regular clients if you're mm-hmm. going to go and work freelance or whether you're going to go find a find a facility to work with or a studio to work with so yeah i, I think for anyone starting out kind of like i did when i was at university just try and make as much of the time as possible especially using the facilities as much as possible i'm mentoring a couple of guys who are just coming to the end of their year on my old course now i do a mentoring program with the with the university and yeah they're kind of realizing that in a few months time they won't have access to all of this gear that they've had access to for three years so they're <laughs> yeah. kind of thinking well how you know obviously it's a lot of very expensive equipment but you know they're kind of thinking well i'm going to take on a couple of extra projects just before i leave just so i can uh, maximize the use of it so yeah i think just recording as much as you possibly can for sure and i think that's a that's a great takeaway too just in in any pursuit but certainly any audio pursuit you know get out there and just do it and and learn and record a track record something that maybe sounds like junk but then the next time you do it it's going to sound a little better whatever you're working on mixing recording anything like that you know the idea is 
you know, we can read and, and I, I give tips and advice and all that stuff. And, and, and that's great. And, and, and please, you know, keep listening, but, you know, getting out there and doing it is there, there's no substitute for that. So Matt, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Right on. Well, that's all we have for our show today. I again wanted to thank Matt North for joining me. If you'd like to learn more about his work or possibly seek out his services, you can find him on Twitter. That's at Matt North Audio or on his website, mattnorthaudio.co.uk. Thank you so much for listening today. And for links and information about today's show and our guest, you can check out our show notes at audioskills.com slash podcast. Now go out there and make some great music ready to go even deeper with your recording mixing and music production we've got all the info and techniques you need in one place so you can turn it up go to audioskills.com and access a huge library of video tutorials and private workshops so you make progress even faster come back next week for a brand new episode of the audio skills podcast podcast